almost half a century, Corrective Services Commissioner Ron Woodham has faced up to many of the country's toughest criminals. Gaining a reputation as a legendary reformer who changed the system forever. Now, with unprecedented and extraordinary access, the gates are unlocked as we continue exploring the inner workings of the prison system. Guided by the veteran prison's commander, who reveals exclusively his intimate knowledge of this huge and complex industry run with military precision. Where prisoners are controlled, educated and rehabilitated. And those seeking redemption get a second chance and learn a new way of living. Where dedicated guards must control drugs and other contraband cope with violent, resentful or mentally unstable inmates yeah. and be forever on the alert in the dangerous, impenetrable, maximum security fortress known as Supermax. Home to those classified as never to be released. you, do you realise it's an offence to bring any contraband into the HRM CC? I've been in my work uh, Do you have any phones, prohibited drugs or contraband on in your possession? No officer, no. Thank you. Get around please. Thank you. So Ronnie, you too? Yep. Even the commissioner gets done here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I just want to say, th this isn't done for the cameras. No. This is standard operating procedure. Yeah. We've had two of the bosses come through with us. It doesn't matter who you are. If Barry O'Farrell comes here, he gets the same treatment. Whoever you are, you get tested before you go into this joint. It's maximum security. It's the Supermax. Building the Supermax took a lot of heat out of maximum security right across the board. The officers have taken charge at one stage, you would think in some of the jails the crims were running it. I think they were. And we took that right off them and gave it back to the officers in total control. That took a lot of heat out of it and put the officers back where they should be, right on top. See, if anyone now raises their head, we chop it off. All inmates within the HRMCC are deemed to be extreme high risk um, and they are moved on a regular basis to allow for uh, searching of their property, searching of the cell to make sure there has been no um, damage done or contraband placed within the cell. So this is the control room, eh? Yeah, this is what I call the nerve centre of the Supermax. And uh, there's 159 cameras in the cell. How many? 159 cameras. And, the and they go through sequences. Yeah. This is it. We've got exercise yards here. With yeah. th these are the blokes. They you can don't. apply to, to be in that exercise yard with another prisoner. Is that correct? Two, only two. Only two. Yeah. And, and they've got to consent time. to be with each other. Yeah, and we've got to agree that they can be with each other. And we've got intel that they can't be, or we think they're planning and plotting something. Uh, we split them up. So what do they just talk to each other and walk around? That's it. There's 159 cameras you told me. I've got them all in front of me. Is there one inch where your officer can't see? Other than the cells they live in, everything else is covered. Everything? Yep. A now that's camera exercise. 455 it says. Hmm. That's 40 foot above the jail. Yeah. And that's particularly if there's an aircraft in the area. Is that what it's, that's all about? Yeah, it can be. It can zoom in on people outside on the street as well or yeah. on the top of the roofs and that sort of thing. But the, uh, it, it's specifically put in place for what happens overseas where uh, helicopter extractions are quite common 
and they drop ladders down and prisoners get up and they cart them away with them hanging off the ladders and that sort of thing. So you can monitor or aircraft can, movement? Yeah, or they drop we weapons in Yeah. and then the prisoners are armed inside. Any attempts to escape? Are there things that concern well, you as a commissioner? Yeah, we've found... Um, we've got one prisoner in here for uh, five life sentences mm. who used to be uh, a key maker and in another jail, he made a key that fitted the maximum security cell he was in mm. out of a plastic tub for their property. Just by watching, never had the key in his possession, just by looking at the key, he made a perfect key after about three months in an attempt to get out. That's it. But he can make a key just by looking at it. And the right people are in the CVMAX. If they were running around in normal routine in the other maximum security jails, it'd be mayhem. And in there, they don't have to prove themselves either. Because as soon as you put some of them out in the jail, they'll arm up. And it's like the old gunfighters in the West. Yeah. Who's going to be top dog? Did the sunshine, Ronnie? Yep. It's the most secure exercise yard in any jail in Australia. As you look up, you can see the anti-helicopter wires. The big wires that yeah. stop one landing with the blades. Yeah. You know, even the small choppers can't land yeah. in the positioning of those wires. And then you've got the netting across the top to capture anything that's dropped in or attempted to drop in. So I'm fascinated, there's a garden here. One of your multi-murderers, Lindsay Rose, tends to it. Now he's the bloke, wasn't he a contract killer that killed the wrong people? Is that him? Yeah, he did on one occasion. And he's the key maker I referred to. He's the one he that's next to be, yeah. yeah, a locksmith, yeah. So he gets in here and tends to the garden. That's right. They can't see this area from their cells? No. No. What view from the cells? We're gonna have a look at that in a minute. We'll have a look. Can't Can you see much at all. Nothing? <laughs> Bit of, very little. bit of concrete Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, more or less. Yeah. We can give them a room with a view of a brick wall. And they, every now and then, I suppose, they hear that uh, horn in the background and think, it yeah. would be nice to be getting on that and going back to Sydney. They won't be going right. back. They're not going back. Officer, is it? The cage? The cage, yeah. No, it's so locked in to make their phone call. Can I have a look at that? That's... <laughs> what, so, uh, when do they get to make a phone call? Well, they've got a proved phone list in here. Yeah. That they can phone, their yeah. family. Everything is listened to live and recorded. And then... And uh, you hear every word of the conversation from and, both sides. And record it. To but use. not legal visits, but normal visit, uh, normal phone calls, yes. And they're locked in there for the duration and they're let out. This yeah. gap here yeah. is where they put their hands out to get the handcuffs on and draw back in before the gates open. So they've, they're uncuffed in there. Yeah. They put before their hands they out go back there. to the cell, they're cuffed. Yeah. Every one of them. Yeah. So they're cuffed. And ankle cuffed. And ankle here. cuffed. Now, how many officers? There always two officers? Four in here. Four? Yeah. So. It's very, very tight. So this is what Ivan Mlat spends 24-7 in? Yes. Okay. Can this we have a look at it? It's a typical cell. Yes. Right here. So this is what Ivan Mlat spends 24-7 in. Can this we have a look a at it? This is a typical cell. Yes. Right here. This is another airlock. Right. Where the officers, again, the prisoners have to be moved, that flaps open and they put their hands out. Cuffs. Everything's concrete, it's all, it's not getting moved anywhere. It's all anchored to the floor, including the bed. There's nothing, no bits of furniture that can be used to barricade a door. 
or attack an officer with. And then a shower with a rose at the top. Yeah. And we can cut the water off, they can't flood anything. So if they look like they playing up here... on the time switch. The water goes off. Yeah. And then out here... Is the exercise yard that they've got. Let me just measure this. I step her out like I'm measuring a putt for nearest the pin. One, two, three, four metres, roughly. One, two, three, four and a bit. So, again, a slab can't be moved, can't be used. That's and right. a bit of sun. Yeah. No escapes from here. No. All inmates are given the opportunity to exercise on a daily basis. Their rear cell doors are open in the morning um, and the opportunity to exercise in their rear yard, uh, both in the morning and in the afternoon. You've got some good men and women looking after this facility. I've got Excellent. a few of them today. And Excellent. You wouldn't want to walk a day in their shoes, but gee whiz, they do a job. They do, and they do it well. And uh, they're, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough of them. Yeah. Okay, sir, post correct. Supermax is quite intense. Staff are put under the pump on a daily basis. Um, it's very stressful for staff to work with some of the inmates we have here. Control to the MOH, Mr. Hopkins. Please control, yes, yes. Your organisation strives towards sustainability, self-sustainability. We've got industries in the, in the furniture trade, we refurbish the school desks and that for the education. So we make curtains for Spotlight, we make... We you, what, you make what? Curtains for Spotlight. You mean that my curtains may have been made by you? Because I go to Could Spotlight have every now and then. Could have. Our industries are in excess turnover of 35 million a year. This is the furniture shop. These are maximum security inmates. Um, we've got 45 inmates that work in here. They do um, all carpentry work. We do contracts for the education department, which is a big contract. And we're doing tent, tent floors and so forth for the army. We have inmates in here doing traineeships, they, um, so they can learn a trade as well. It's very similar to a um, furniture shop you'd find anywhere. I mean, equipment like this machine behind me, it's, um, CNC route, $150,000 machine. Inmates learn to operate the computer, they design and draw and great setup. This workshop, I mean, you've you seen they have all the tools, hammers, chisels, all sorts of equipment that they use during the course of the day, but they love to come down here and work. And they know if they play up or anything like that, they don't come here. We refurbish classrooms. We've got a couple of hundred units of, of demountables. They can just bring a truck in and, and put a school up. OK, well, this is a minimum security section work, work area. Um, as you can see behind me, these, these six fellows are doing a, um, a forklift operator's ticket. Uh, I've got a guy in from the TAFE who gives them hands-on skills that they can actually go out and get a job. The gauges are all right. Your lights working? When I started, it was a matter of just locking them up and waiting till their time was done and then kicking them out the door. You know, this day and age, we look at giving them some sort of skill to get them a job outside to try and reduce the recidivism rate. Um, and that's, you know, there's more and more emphasis on that as time goes by, so it's really good. Hey. Yeah, we've got to we bake our own bread. Well, for the whole system? Yeah. Like Brewarrina, you wouldn't send it from here, but, <laughs> but you know, on the main run. Yeah. Average about 4,000 loads a day, and that's 
distributed uh, pretty much around the state. Uh, we make weekend lunches, which is like sausage rolls and pizzas, and they're for the inmates for their lunch on weekends. Um, they get made, frozen, and then shipped out. Yeah, the bak baker is a good job, because we also offer um, traineeships here too. Um, I've got seven guys doing certificate two in food processing. I've got a couple of guys who's doing certificate three in business admin in the office. Um, these are certificates they can use when they get out. We uh, produce our own milk and also, and we grow a heap of veggies around the place as well. They process uh, around about five to six tonne of veg various vegetables per week. This facility encompasses 1,200 acres of um, farmland, etc. We have approximately 265 inmates here at the moment. We can hold more than that. Uh, we hope in the near future to build a boning room out the back. Uh, that will process our beef, which will go into all the meals as well. Walking down that road every day with a bit of freedom and things like that is so great. We walk down maybe a kilometre to, to work, where we pass duck ponds. You know, compared to a lot of other places, this, this is heaven. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they've got to go back, and they still find that hard, because they miss their families. But if you're going to do jail, this is the place to do it. Steady. All the horses that come up here are ex-gallopers, and my job here is to and turn them into and dressage hold. horses. And halt. And one of them was just taken recently as a police horse. So I've put my name down to do a stable hands course up at Skane TAFE. Hopefully uh, it'll be a foundation laid for, for um, a job when, I, when I'm released. Actually coming to jail was a good thing to me. I was a, I was a, a full blown alcoholic for 15 years. Lost my family, lost my, you know, everyone like that, my wife, my kids. Uh, I now currently do AA every week, which I've been doing for over 18 months now. But it's a positive, that's the way I look at it as long as there's a positive. Out of something bad always comes something good and this is the good for me. This is the heaviest jail. Uh, some of the most serious offenders in Australia here. They could well live next door to you or work beside you. You know, the jail, they supply pots and pans and, and a knife, which is unusual for a jail too. I've just received a phone call that a visitor is going to bring in some drugs in, with a balloon. Commissioner Corrective Services New South Wales has approved a joint operation utilising resources from Corrective Services New South Wales and the New South Wales Police Force. I'm amazed that you do joint operations with the New South Wales Police Force where visitors are, uh, are, are searched and the contraband you find is quite unbelievable. Yeah, we do regular uh, planned operations with uh, New South Wales Police mm. and they are and a drug dog in it, and we've even got dogs now that can smell a mobile phone. Taking place at the various correctional centres. Intelligence suggests that contraband is becoming an issue within the Long Bay complex. An area of concern is that contraband may be uh, introduced into the centre via visitors. All visitors to the complex today will be screened by a canine and if necessary, the following may occur. Property search, a vehicle search, or a pat or strip search. Uh, the pat or strip search, this is to be conducted by New South Wales Police only. Number is 1012, repeat 1012. Well, basically, we're back up to the staff that are on the ground. We're uh, like the eye in the sky as such, and we, we can actually watch what's going on, so we assist them. And if we see something, we're able to then communicate via radio or by telephone and tell them there's something going on that they may have missed. Morning. Hi, who are you here to see? So just make your way over there, thank you. Look, there's a number of reasons why they try to traffic drugs in. One can be um, as a currency, um, the other for their own self-fulfilment. OK, we're officers from the State Emergency Unit. We're screening everyone coming onto the complex yep. today. OK, but before we start, I have to caution it is an offence to have any drugs, weapons, syringes, tools of escape, poisons.
prescribed medication and non-prescribed medication. No, no, if you have any of these such items, now's the time to declare so. I don't have anything. Okay, no worries. I'll get you guys just to hold your hands like so and just remain still and silent during the search. Thank you. <laughs> Good boy, nice job. Ripley is an operational drug dog. He's a um, passive alert detection dog. So when he finds drugs, he will actually sit. And that's how he tells me that there's drugs there. He's trained on five odours. He's trained on heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, marijuana and amphetamines. When Ripley's about to um, search, I put on what's called his drug collar and it's like a workout. He knows then that it's time to go to work as opposed to just his choke tank. I'll gather him up by the lead, hold on to the collar and get him all excited, get him ready to work and then I'll say fetch and he'll search low, he'll search people's shoes front and back and then we'll go up and we'll search their pockets front and back and high end. If he's um, cleared the line, if he hasn't given me a positive indication then we let the people go and move on to the next. I've just received a phone call from another correctional centre uh, who's informed me that a visitor um, is going to bring in some drugs and of course we'll be targeting that visitor. Before we start our search I'm going to have to formally caution you that it's an offence to bring onto this correctional complex any drugs, weapons, alcohol, tools of escape. If we get a positive indication we pull that person out of the line and conduct a property search and depending on that a vehicle search if we find contraband the police are called and they perform a strip search and that's Ripley's job done then. Yes, good boy! One of the visitors um, that we screened and did a property search on, um, what we found in her bag was some GBM which we believe to be green vegetable matter, or commonly known as marijuana. Drugs can lead to a lot of problems in jails. You know, there's a lot of standovers, a lot of bashings and stuff like that, and inmates can be difficult to control when they're under the influence of drugs and alcohol. People are very inventive and they can put it any anywhere. Dogs will find it. If it's there, Good boy. they'll find it. We monitor the boom gate from here. As you can see, there's four cameras on it. So it gives a record as to who comes in and out. Attention, attention, complex monitor room to SEC area two, response team. We had some surveillance on that uh, particular visitor coming up from the boom gate. And that visitor was actually seen placing an object out of her bag and put it in her shoe. Good boy. Good. The lady that we just searched has a full syringe. She just pulled out of her right boot. Oh. Syringes are, you know, are, are really a nightmare for correctional officers um, because they can be stabbed um, and also with the blood diseases that can be found in those syringes. So that's extremely important uh, for us that we stop that sort of contraband from coming in the centres. We're under the impression that you're under, under the influence of a, of, a, of a drug or alcohol because of your behaviour shown here. Okay, so I've just con had a conversation with the MOS up there and they feel that um, they're not going to let you have a visit today. Okay, however, you come back when you're, when you're normal, then you can certainly have a visit. Okay. Okay, thank you. make sure she, she does actually go out. Yeah, I can let you know with today's success, uh, what we've actually done, we've done 295 visitors were actually screened by the canines. 44 visitors' property have been searched. Three visitors have been strip searched by the New South Wales Police. There have been two police charges and six visitors have been denied entry to the correctional centres. They will be referred to our prohibition section to find out if they will be not allowed to visit the correctional centres any, uh, anymore for a period of time, as deemed by the Commissioner. I love my job, and you get the drugs and you get the fines and you see his happy little face and he's playing with his dummy, it's the best job in the whole world.
You see, the government made a decision many years ago to close down psychiatric hospitals and put people back in the community. Do I now take it there are people who you have control of that maybe you shouldn't have control of, they should be kept somewhere else? We still have you know, hundreds of mentally ill people, hundreds. Yeah. And, um, and some of them commit very serious crime as well. Yeah, exactly. And they can't be just held in a hospital. This is the heaviest women's jail. And we've got uh, some of the most serious women offenders in Australia here. Some committed some gruesome murders, uh, killed children. I had to battle to build this. So where did they go before you built this? They'd be just up in the jail, getting into all sorts of problems. Yeah. Because they don't know, they're not in touch with reality, some of these people. Yeah. And they'd go and uh, take something from another prisoner's cell and get assaulted, and it's reduced a lot of tension in a jail. It's a, a facility where the case management is it's a psychologist, the, the uh, health staff and the custodial staff work on the one case file. We're quite effective, Keeps, keep a lot of them alive. And what are you going to do to make sure you don't come back, eh? Uh, just never break the law again, never. Mm. You've got to stay your medic keep on your medication. Yes, yes. Mm. Don't go off it. Yes, exactly. What about you, Dom? I'm just in here just for a bit, just for a bit of a common assault that I'd happened with my boyfriend. Yeah. I've been in mental wards since for eight and a half, four, eight and a half years Have now. Have you? Yeah. And are you medicated? You... Like last night I had a few bad dreams. Do you feel like you're all right now? Yeah, I feel all right today. As soon as I woke up, I knew that, I, you know, I could, I was okay. And you've got to think of happy thoughts. Happy Mr. Water. Yeah. Um, is there any chance for an exercise bike so we can exercise on? Because our bike's broken. I got you one before. But our bike's broken out the back here. Yeah, okay. Got one on order. I got you one at the bay, remember? Kisley Jones, how are they? You've been cutting up? Yeah. When did you cut up there? A few days ago. Did you? It's got the ink part of the biro in there. Yeah. The nurses don't, haven't even. You'll end up buggering all your veins, you know. No good. Hmm. I'll get you there. I'll speed up the exercise bike. Yeah, okay. Let's go and have a look at the cell. Pretty bare here, Ron. Yeah. But um, they're allowed some chalk and a board to write on. Yeah. Got TV. Behind perspex, so it can't be. They can't break it. Can't be used it to cut themselves. J just. We're outside with a. An inmate. Mm. She's a murderer, mm. but she's also someone who continually attempts self-harm. Yes, continually. She used to run a fire like flat out into a corner of cement, and she split a fire from the top to the bottom, and it was about that open, that, and they had to tie her up to stop it. Mm. And um, they couldn't sew it. The gap was that wide. They couldn't sew it up. And uh, I saw her over at Bombay and I walked in and I said, uh, what do you need? She said, I want an exercise bike so I can take my aggression out on the bike. So I got her one that day yeah. and she lasted nearly four months. On and, the bike? On the bike, not causing problems. And all of a sudden, bang. Off the rails? Yeah. <coughs> she stabbed another woman 40 times just to see what it was like to kill somebody. The woman hadn't done anything to her? No. Just to kill her? This is a high dependency unit. These are the most uh, mentally ill people we have in this facility, and probably some in the system. So what are you back in court, son? Huh? I'm back in court 21st and 22nd. Yeah. And what do you want to do there? What do you, what do you say to the magistrate? Uh, well, there's not much I can really say, but I'd like to just let him know that I've got a little kid on the, on the way. My missus is six weeks pregnant, and how long have you been battling mental illness? Is it something? Is it caused by drugs? What causes yeah, it? Yeah, I've, I've been smoking ice for probably five years now and 
Yeah, drug and alcohol is a big thing in my life. I didn't have much love growing up, so at the end of the day I'm here, aren't I? And I want to get out and just try and get normal, you know what I mean? I've got a kid, that's my first kid in ever. When's the baby, Jim? 2013. How old were you started using ice? Probably 18. But I look at that young bloke I'm talking to, he's the same age as my young bloke. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart, you know. Nice. And he admits to what use of ice, God knows what else he's done. Yeah. And you're not astonished to see him back here in three or six months? Not really. There's a missing step on the outside. There's some cycle that can... Yeah, it's like we get them in here, they get cleaned up, they're great. They go outside, they try and do their best. There's just not that help out there for them. It's something you don't expect when you first join the job, but when you do come in, you form a bit of a working relationship, whether, whether you like it or not, that's the reality that's of it. That's how it works. Yeah, and you have to do it, you know, for my safety, the staff's safety, the inmate's safety. What are you all, Corey boys, eh? You know what's over the wall here? Yeah. Sydney Stadium, Olympic Stadium. Sydney Stadium. 2000, I called the race. This one I read about her, sir, Mr. Go Adley. On. Kathy Freeman, he's Kathy running around the track because she is uh, proud to be black. When she rang with our flag all up high, she looked up at that image in the sky and thanked her to be blessed because she was our very best. Trying to, well. them, trying to get them published at the moment, waiting yeah. on publishing. You won't get them published in here. I know, sir, you know. But trying to get away from crime, you know, and yeah. get away from the drugs and the alcohol and all that there, you know. I started up with, with growing up with Aboriginal people up in the bush. At a very young boy, I was taken to the uh, site of the Mile Creek Massacre, where 28 women and children were murdered by white people. I can see by looking at you, you're, you're, you're emotional about this, you're moved by that. As I went through the ranks, I could see that there was a lot missing mm. for Aboriginal people. And so we ended up buying that three kilometres of Clarence River frontage up at Tabulum. And we built a facility there for mainly Aboriginal people, men and women. Meeting in Belunda means second chance. It's a second chance at life. Like they've had their, their ch first chance, I suppose, going through life, going through juvenile justice. And then they turned up in the mainstream after they turned 18. Uh, some of them come here because they're sick of the jail system. They want to have another go where they can sort of change their life around. Their issues are mainly drug and alcohol, anger management and stuff like that. We're a working cattle property and we take residents here who have been to court. They've been convicted, but their sentence has been suspended and they're referred to us and they're here roughly between six to 12 months. We take predominantly Aboriginal men and women between 18 and 40. Alcohol and drugs, they destroy a lot of families, you know. It's not their fault, you know, with these people. They do know what's right and wrong, but they, do, they don't know any other way. You know, they just need someone to, just to give them a bit of guidance to show them another track in life. They've done a great deal of good for Aboriginal people, those programs, and, and uh, a lot of them don't come back. That's my sister, that's my mum, that's my old man. There's my girlfriend, I've been in her for about a year and a half. You know, I'll probably get engaged to her when I get out. <laughs> to the kitchen area, all the boys spend a lot of time here, um, cook up some big feeds. You know, the jail, they supply pots and pans and, and a knife, which is unusual for a jail too, but, you know, we're trusted with that. <laughs> the development of the program um, was, came about in the late 80s. Uh, where we noticed um, in corrections the recidivism rate, the return to jail rate of young adult offenders was uh, considerably high, e.g. to the point of a high 90%.
we had to do something. 18 and 25 year old males are very, very impulsive. It's high risk taking behaviour. It could be your son that had a spur of the moment impulsive, stupid mistake, drank too much, run off the road and killed someone and in jail. I've seen people we've literally had to drag off a truck on a Sunday to start the program, didn't want to be here, and in 16 weeks time we can't get rid of them, they don't want to leave because they've changed so much and grown. Um, thanks guys, so today's uh, expedition, uh, we're going to be going out on the Moomba Loomba Plateau, uh, we'll be out there till tomorrow. So today is about uh, the, these fellows are nearing the end of the program, it's about putting them in a position of uh, responsibility handing the trust and responsibility back to them. Today uh, we're going to leave the centre and go out in the bus. Uh, my role is to mentor and guide these guys through the program. I didn't want to get out of jail not having achieved anything. So for me, by helping these young fellas, it gives me you know, the opportunity to say, hey, I, I actually did something, I got something out of it. So I guess it's a personal thing. Back before, I just used to do things without thinking, and I used to like not listen to anyone, not take advice from people. But now, like we can think straight, think before I do something. That's those kind of things. You don't um, appreciate what you've got until it's gone, you know. And you start to realise what you can do in, in order to be able to obtain that back and be able to keep it. Twenty years old. I'm twenty. I'm nineteen. Today, guys, we're doing Dangle Duo. But when you're on the top of the platform, we're going to ask you what's changed for you in the program. <laughs> Being in Oberon, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to put some trust in people. When you're up there on the high ropes and that, you know, your life's literally not in your hands. You know, if the bloke down there isn't paying attention or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. Boys, give a bit of encouragement, eh? Right? And you can, you can fall. You know, you can seriously injure yourself. Yeah, you to get up. The thing for me is you have to get in there and have a go, you know? And you have to get in there and have a go and you learn you have to have a positive attitude to things. Stretch life legs. Hold on. Doing all these programs shows you and how to help with a positive lifestyle and just to um, work better at things. Try harder and know that there's so much more to live for than being stuck in jail. Yep. Um, I don't have very many master criminals here. There's no Ronald Biggs that have planned a crime for three years before committing it. It's usually an impulsive mistake. Sometimes it's fueled by drug and alcohol or anger. Where do you go first? Him first? And we're in the business of putting ourselves out of business. We don't want people to come back to jail. Can't give up. Nah, never will we give up. We do not get inmates from Mars. They do not come from Mars and we send them back to Mars. They're people's sons, fathers, and they could well live next door to you or work beside you. They're normal people. We'll get out of here. Uh, I see lots of changes in the inmates over the 16 weeks. The ability to speak up in a group. For a lot of these guys, they've never, you know, they've never sat in a group, they've never worked as a team, uh, they've never been able to listen to others. This whole program is about giving them some ideas and then testing them on those. Because uh, in the near future, a lot of these young guys are going to be back out in the community where they don't have somebody looking over their shoulder or keeping them on the right track. You can clip that loop. That if you don't provide these opportunities, they're getting back into the world with nothing. And a lot of them do have nothing. So giving them that opportunity, giving them that platform, um, I think is probably the most important thing you can do. And there's not many programs that, that offer it other than, other than this program. Imagine this. Imagine the abseil's really steep. I've done a couple of things at this jail, like I've got my um, blue card, forklift tickets and bobcat tickets. So when I get out, I've got more opportunities to work and do better things for myself on the outside.
doing really well, mate. Yeah, that's it. Keep your feet nice and wide apart. I wish I would have done things a lot different, to be honest. I can't change what I've done. It's what I do from now on that counts. So I believe what I do from here on in will determine where I end up in the future. Right, start taking the slack out, guys. All right, Corey, don't worry. I got you. Mum didn't want to see me in there, you know, in the big white, in the green and that. I haven't really seen much of my dad since I've been in here. Because he's kind of supporting me at the same time when I'm in here. Like, it was hard for me when I was out, but like, I have a confidence in myself that I can say no. Since I'm in here doing all these all this programs, like this stuff, yeah, it's changed me. Remember to set your goals past the trapeze so you can reach it. Oh yeah, I'm going to try and um, get the wally. Come on, Corey, you can do it. Just put yeah. your hands out. It's far away, bro. Like, I try to tell me brothers. No, I'm right, right. right. Trying, trying to get to it, that's all. And like, try to pass on the message that, you know, not, not to come here, not to do bad things, get a job. You know, just, just live a normal life instead of coming to jail and ruin it. Yep. Oh! Nice. Nice. Yeah. Good on you. Nice. Oh. What? Oh. On this camp, I've asked the, the boys to write a four page letter to themselves. And I've said to them that I will send that to them a year after they're released. And I think with all goal setting, it's. Uh, if you write your goals down and you set it out clearly, it holds you more to that. So if we can get them to write those down, uh, it's a really good reminder, 12 months down the track, hey, this was your idea, this is where you wanted to be, um, are you still on track for that? What are you doing about that? I sit back and I think about all the, all the things I've done with my family and um, the things I could do better and the things I could do more of. And when you, when you come to jail, like for me, my family come and visit me every single weekend, you know, and I, I see I see tears on my mum on my mother's face and and if if that isn't enough, if that isn't enough to make to make you learn your lesson, then there's not gonna be many other things that will. It's the last, it's the last obstacle, man. There is no magic pill. I, I'd love and I tell them an induction, I'd love to be able to give every mate a magic pill they could take that'd prevent him coming back from jail. <laughs> Uh, we can't stop an inmate coming back from jail. What we do is we equip them with the tools to stop them coming back to jail. And nice. it works. <laughs> I'm the king of the world! It's very challenging um, being released from jail into the community. A lot of people are institutionalised from their time in custody, so just simple tasks can be very difficult. Imagine being released after 20 years into, into the community and not knowing how to use an ATM card, not knowing how to catch a bus. A lot of buses now no longer accept money, you need tickets, and just knowing the process of what you need to do in order to just do normal day-to-day -day activities can be incredibly challenging. And so having someone in the community to assist you to adapt and deal with those issues is essential and Probation and Parole Service does provide that. Um, offenders can be placed on supervision by community offender services either by order of the court or from release from custody by the State Parole Authority. Hello Fook, how are you today? I'm alright. And that's where a Probation and Parole Officer will assist an offender to give them the support they need to become a functioning member of the community again. Oh, I've been all right. You've been okay? Yeah. What's been happening? Not one single parole officer goes on their own to see these people, especially their unannounced home visits. Mm. There's a lot of difference between telling an offender you're going to be there at four o'clock tomorrow yeah. and let them be all prepared for you yeah. than to walk in at eight o'clock that night with no warning. So here we go. Yeah, and you see the real thing. Mm. And of course, the, there's always, no one goes on their own. How's it going? What's it doing? Right. How's it going? You're on remand? Yeah. You're not very old, like how old are you? 24. How long do you think you'll get? <coughs> A couple of years. Yeah. You coming back? Not here, no. Corrective Services is the agency that can't say no. 
Um, we get whatever the criminal justice system hands us and it's our job to deal with that. We've had some bad days. Uh, we certainly had some uh, you know, hard times during those bad days, but the good days outweigh the bad days. And if we had more bad days than good, I wouldn't be here. What about you, champ? First time in, learning a valuable lesson. I've got three little girls and um, fiance outside. And, uh, How yeah. old are your kids? Six, four, yeah. and two. There's absolutely no reason why you cannot go out into the community and lead a fulfilling life in the community. Have your family, have your white house with the white picket fence. There's, there's no rule that says you're not entitled to that just because you have been in jail. What are you doing, mate? Remand. No good. I so said when I was a kid, I was fascinated by what was on, going on behind those walls. You want to know what the unknown is, you know? You want to see what's in there, but once you see it, you're like, oh, everyone's a person, they're all people. Just committed a crime. Jail should in many instances be the, the, the place of last resort, not the place of first option. Mate, it breaks my heart a bloke your age, you know, being in here. When you get sentenced, you do the program, right, and, yeah. and, and the experts say, this bloke has shown that he can control his anger. He's not going to belt someone in a pub anymore, you know? This bloke has got a bit of potential. This is society taking care of its own rather than pushing them behind large walls and to all intents and purposes forgetting about them because in most cases, those inmates will at some stage be released back onto those streets. If they avail themselves and do something about of the programs yeah. and do something about their offending behaviour by, while they're in here, yeah. some of them will never come back. Yeah. Some of them will never come back. And that's worth the effort from us yeah. and it's worth the effort from them. Commissioner of Corrective Services, Mr Ron Woodham, he's been the one who's uh, directed us, guided us, led us. Many programs in the Department of Corrective Services in New South Wales would not exist without his vision, his leadership. How would Ron Woodham like to be remembered? Oh, I'd like to be remembered that um, I made a real positive, worthwhile contribution to corrections in New South Wales. Yeah. And that uh, the changes that I drove and implemented uh, were positive and for the better of the system. And that people in years to come will benefit from it, staff and, and uh, prisoners. And to the people in New South Wales, I hope I've kept you the safe as I, as I could. On that note, you've done your job. Good luck, old mate. Okay, mate. Well, I'll tell you something. It's been an unbelievable day.